Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 1E. We're going to talk about what makes some parts of our genome, some DNA sequences within our genome, be genes that function in producing everything we need to be the organisms we are, whereas the rest of our genome is just basically inert. We'll talk about RNA and protein very briefly, what these molecules are, and we'll talk about genes as informational entities in DNA and the informational processes by which the DNA sequence in a gene becomes usable information that results in a functional protein. So first, RNA. RNA is, like DNA, a nucleic acid. It's made of subunits that are very similar to the subunits in DNA. The backbone is slightly different. The backbone of DNA is deoxyribose. The backbone of RNA is a molecule called ribose. As the name indicates, the only difference is that there's an oxygen on ribose that isn't in deoxyribose. One other difference between DNA and RNA is RNA uses one different base. It still uses A and G and C, but instead of T, it uses the base uracil, a U. So at positions in that in DNA would be a T, the corresponding position in RNA, oh, you can't see that one. Let's do this one. This would be a T in DNA. This will be a U in RNA. U, like T, pairs with A. So if this RNA were to form base pairs, the U would be paired, sorry, U would be paired with an A. Let's draw that right. RNA is not usually base paired. It's transiently base paired with DNA when it's being synthesized, and it may form base pairs for various functions. It can fold up on itself. Different parts of itself can base pair with each other if the bases are complementary. It can also form transient base pairs with other RNA molecules, in particular with short segments in the transfer RNA molecules that actually decode the sequence for protein synthesis. Now, protein is a very different kind of molecule. It's not a nucleic acid at all. It's still a polymer. It's an informational polymer. It consists of subunits that are similar in their ability to form a chain, but have different properties. And these subunits are called amino acids. We'll talk a lot more about proteins in Module 3. For now, all you need to know is that the proteins are the enzymes and the structures, almost all of the working parts of the cell, are protein. Now, <clears throat> as I said, most of our genome isn't genes. Genes are only a small subset of our DNA. And if you just looked at our DNA, any segment of your DNA, you'd have no way to tell that it did or didn't encode a gene if you look at a piece of DNA just looks like DNA. Unless you examine the sequence and analyze the sequence, you couldn't tell this was a gene. Genes are informational entities, not physically distinct from the rest of the genome. And their informational properties that make them genes are, first, that they have signals, signals called the promoter and the terminator, which are short sequences that direct proteins to carry out the process of transcription, to make an RNA copy of this part of the DNA. And typically, they also have, um, within the sequence between the promoter and terminator, they have sequences that specify specific amino acids for translation for formation of protein, including they have signal sequences that say, make this into a protein. So this is by far the majority of genes. Some genes, however, encode functional RNAs. That is, these are RNAs that don't serve to make protein, but are functional in their own right. 
Most of these are enzymatic components of the protein synthesis machinery, the ribosome, or they are the adapter molecules that decode the RNA sequence and connect it to the, pro the amino acids that are going to be inserted. Now, here's a diagram to give you some sense of how these regulatory signal sequences act. Each of these signals is a short sequence of bases. And in this diagram, again, using what we said about representation, you'll see two lines representing double-stranded DNA with the crosshatch marks to help remind us that these two lines represent DNA. This oval represents RNA polymerase. That's the enzyme that's going to carry out transcription. That is, it's going to synthesize the RNA using a DNA template. And it's recognizing two signals on the DNA. So first, it recognizes a sequence that's effectively a start sequence. That's the sequence called the promoter. And the promoter tells RNA polymerase, start here to make RNA. RNA polymerase then proceeds along the DNA. And as it does, it makes an RNA copy of the DNA. I'm sorry, I can't do a better drawing of this. Um, and it stops when it comes to a sequence called the terminator. And this is another short regulatory sequence that tells RNA polymerase this is the place to stop making RNA, to disassociate from the DNA, and to release the RNA from the DNA. So this RNA is actually not connected physically to the DNA once it's finished. So we have two signals, a start here signal and a stop here signal that are recognized by RNA polymerase. Okay. Here's a different drawing. You've seen this drawing before, um, representing the same process. So we have the two strands of DNA shown base paired here. And this diagram shows that, in fact, the two strands come apart. They're unzipped by RNA polymerase, so it can make a complementary RNA to one strand. This also lets me point out that the promoter has a second function. In addition to telling RNA polymerase where to start on the DNA, it also tells it which direction to go. And it does this basically by telling RNA polymerase which strand to use. If RNA polymerase uses the bottom strand in the drawing, it has to go this way because RNA is synthesized from its 5' prime end to its 3' prime end on a DNA strand that runs 3' prime to 5'. Prime. So that's the bottom strand. If RNA polymerase were to use the top strand, it would have to be going in that direction. And so a function of the promoter is not just to say start here, but to also say either start here and use the bottom strand, so you're going that way, or start here and use the top strand, so you're going this way. And again, the terminator tells RNA polymerase where to stop. Now let's add on to this process the signals that control protein synthesis. So now we have two more signals. Another start signal, the start codon it's called, and another stop signal, the start codon. So each protein coding gene has two start here signals. It has the promoter, which is a signal in the DNA, and it has the start codon, which is a signal that acts in the RNA, but in fact that is coded also in the DNA. But it's recognized in the RNA by the ribosome, the protein and RNA factory that will synthesize the protein. There's also two kinds of stop signals. There's the terminator that we already introduced that tells RNA polymerase where to stop. And there's a signal in the RNA, it acts in the RNA, it's recognized by the ribosome, tells the ribosome to stop here, stop making protein. Again, 
this sequence is coded, it's specified in the DNA, but it acts in the RNA. So we can make this happen. RNA polymerase, or sorry, the ribosome binds to the start codon. It proceeds along the messenger RNA from its five prime end to its three prime end. And as it goes along, it synthesizes amino acids, assembles amino acids into the polymer of a protein and it stops when it reaches the stop codon. The order of the bases within the DNA determines, of course, the order of the bases in the messenger RNA, and that determines the order of the amino acids in the protein. I'll talk about this in the next video. So here's a question. What does RNA polymerase do when it encounters a stop codon? 